Okay. Uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> we are very glad to have Bo Qing here. Uh, so here, this is the uh, this is Dr. Bo Qing. Bo Qing right now is a research scientist at Google, uh, and uh, his talk uh, his talk uh, name today will be towards the man adaptation in the wild long tail. Uh, sources and open compound targets. Uh, Bo Qing is a research scientist at Google Seattle and a principal investigator at uh, ICSI Berkeley. Uh, his research in machine learning and computer vision uh, focus on sample efficient learning and the visual uh, analytics of objects, scenes, human activities, and their attributes. Before joining Google in 2019, he worked in Tencent and also was a tenure track uh, system professor at the University of Central Florida. He had received the NSF CR2 award in 2016 and the NSF award in 2017, both of which were the first of their can ever granted to USAF. Okay, uh, I think let's now welcome uh, Bo Qing to start the talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Li Wei but a very nice introduction. And thank all the organizers for having me to uh, give this talk in this workshop. Um, yeah, so I will talk about some visual recognition in the world. Um, uh, but before that, um, myself is in Google Seattle. And the picture here you see is the photo I took, um, one of the net views of the beautiful Seattle. It's too bad that um, <laughs> the workshop actually was supposed to be here, happening right here in Seattle this year. but. Uh, uh, we all know. So in the future, if you got time, you stop by Seattle, do let me know. I can host you a talk um, or, or just a social visit in, in Google. Okay, let me start. So I want to start with um, <coughs> this paper. It's a little bit old paper now. Uh, it's about more than 10 years ago, published in CVPR. It's called Detecting Unseen Object Classes by between class attribute transfer. So I'm not sure if any of the authors here actually um, is in this workshop. I personally, I, had a, I have a lot of respect to this paper um, because in 2009, I was um, um, still at an early stage of my graduate study, trying to figure out what I want to uh, focus on. Um, then this paper came out, which I really liked a lot. It had a nice, a beautiful design of question here, and also it has a nice, very cute design of a graphic model. So that was the moment I realized that machine learning could be really useful for computer vision. And uh, myself, my style of research is a little bit more still also um, on the mathematical side. So I like machine learning a lot, but I want to actually focus on real problem in computer vision as well. Therefore, I applied for a PhD program um, focused on um, solving real visual recognition problems, but from um, a machine learning perspective. So from 2011 to 2015, I basically focused on this so-called domain adaptation problem. And here is my thesis, and here uh, it's myself about 10 years ago. <laughs> I hope there are no much difference from now. Um, so domain adaptation, the idea is try to uh, extend what the visual recognition model is able to do in computer vision um, on a training set to some testing set, which is a little bit different from the training. So in other words, they have different underlying distributions here, but our goal is always to actually generalize the model, not only to the testing scenario, which we already see in the training, but also some new testing scenarios a little bit. I worked on this a lot. I, I feel uh, it's really nice. And I basically published first all on um, machine learning um, conference venues, um, mostly on Eurix, one in SML, and uh, uh, only one actually in computer vision in Siri PR. Uh, well, I was not very active in, in the Vision conference, a lot of things happened uh, during the period of my PhD study. Uh, so here, the, the graph, um, I, I'm sure all the audience uh, in this workshop um, is very familiar with. So we see um, before deep learning, the testing error on ImageNet, top one error, this is, um, eight, sorry, top five, I think. Um, it's, it's still not very satisfying. 
Um, then the deep learning came out in 2012 and so on and so forth. So now we can actually do much better than even human is able to uh, recognize of these 1,000 classes. So, okay, so that was definitely very exciting. And what's even more kind of like exciting on one side, but challenging on the other side. For researchers, and around that time, I have to be very honest with you, I felt it, it's basically a crisis for me. Um, because I worked on domain adaptation, but then um, there is a paper published in 2014 in SML. Uh, they did just, just using deep features and without using any existing kind of advanced techniques, they can already get best results uh, at that moment on a uh, few different benchmark datasets, including some um, um, uh, datasets for domain adaptation. So that was a kind of like a crisis time for me. I was wondering, okay, it's definitely time to shift to deep learning to work on something that I can try to contribute to the visual community, to the vision community after being away for a few years from machine learning. Then maybe I can bring in some new perspectives from machine learning as well. So um, you all know also around that time, uh, not only here we can use deep features, we can also do transfer. We can basically use the ImageNet pre-trained model, then fine-tune the model on all different tasks, and we can actually still um, get a lot of good results. It's become a standard uh, technique right now. So after I came back, so okay, I still want to do visual recognition. I want to recognize a lot of objects. So ImageNet, we are able to recognize about 1,000 classes now. Uh, what about we continue to push the boundary? We try to recognize everything in our visual world. We want to recognize not only the 1,000 um, well, well, well compiled, well labeled, and manually selected images. We want to, for example, go to the world, recognize all the objects in the world. Uh, what can we do? Fortunately, um, there was actually a very good data set, actually two data sets, one published in 2017, the other in 2018. Um, they have between 5,000 and 8,000 classes. Uh, all of them are very natural. <clears throat> I would say this is probably one of the most, um, how to say, kind of scientific data set or professional data set uh, in computer vision because all the images are not labeled by uh, us, like, like, like ordinary uh, annotators. They are labeled by um, real experts uh, who are really, really good at the biology, uh, scientific uh, recognition of the wild animals and wild plants. Um, so we started to work on this. So the very first challenge with, we anticipated was maybe because we have so many classes, so competition is gonna be uh, challenging. But what, did, what we did, did not realize is there is another challenge, which is a long tail of the distribution over all the classes. Um, it's actually very intuitive because when you have about 1000 classes on image light, maybe manually you can still try to um, do the selection, do the pruning, make sure that this set is balanced. But when you have so many classes, it's really hard to do that. And also, it's really hard to sometimes, for the, for the infrequent classes here, it's very hard to get the training images at all. So very naturally, when you try to extend visual recognition um, capability from um, the in-house um, well-compiled data sets to the world, uh, we will have this long-tailed phenomena over classes. So this is not only unique to iNaturalist. Here, I will show you four uh, additional examples. You can see um, on the top, we have objects in the song data set. And you can see here, this is the song data set is, is for scene understanding. It's not for objects in particular, but if we want to annotate those objects in this uh, scene scenario, which is more natural than object-centric uh, images, uh, you, you will get a long tail of the distribution. 
Second example is from Flickr. Flickr, we, we have all um, users from around the globe. So they naturally upload the images, they choose their tag keywords. So also it's very natural, it's some, some of the data in the wild. And you can see, not surprisingly, we got a long tail distribution as well. The third example, probably you are more familiar with because it's uh, one of the recent and high um, profile data sets called um, um, uh, Elvis. It's for instance, segmentation uh, based on Coco. So it's object in the context, it's complex scene, and it's very natural uh, uh, sample of our real world. So when we try to do the calculation of the objects, Again, we got a, a, a long tail distribution uh, in, uh, in the natural world, uh, in the natural, uh, yes, real world. The very last example is um, this one. So we hosted a, a landmark recognition data set, a challenge um, uh, over the last two years, including this year. Um, we tried to recognize all the landmarks around the globe. So as you can see, we got a lot of training images from North America. Let me try to get this. Had got a pointer. We got a lot of training images here from North America. We got a lot of training images from Europe and also East um, Asia. But it's unfortunate that we, we, we really don't have a lot of training images on the other areas uh, of the globe. So very naturally, as you can see, we also got a long tail distribution over the landmarks. So given all of those, I hope that I can convince you um, by now, the long tail distribution over different classes is, uh, is, is really the elephant in the room we should focus on. We should try to um, maybe formulate this problem as an independent problem to study. So because it appears not only in object recognition, as you can see, also in landmark recognition, uh, in Flickr here, tanks, um, in instance segmentation, in different tasks, basically we all have a common phenomenon, which is the classes we are interested in, actually they follow a long tail distribution. If that's the case, if it's so kind of generic in all different visual recognition tasks, why don't we try to um, formalize this as an independent problem, provide a well um, kind of simulated data set for all the future researchers to study. So, Based on that, we uh, started to work on this problem in 2018. Of course, the paper came out in 2019, but we started the work in uh, 2018. What we did is, uh, first of all, we compiled three uh, long-tailed datasets. Um, we basically you know, started still from ImageNet, but we tried to resample the data following a, a, a heavy tail distribution. So we got a, a long-tailed ImageNet. Uh, we do the same for the other two data sets, one for places, the other for face recognition. The reason here we didn't go directly to the natural data sets here or here is we want to have a fairly standard clean definition uh, of this long-tailed recognition problem and also have a medium-sized data set. So all different researchers, no, no matter from academia or from industry, they can work on this problem. Also in this paper, we um, propose uh, um, to improve the neural net architecture by a memory module. So we use this memory bank here to enhance, to, to improve the representation of the tail classes. Um, so that's, that's the paper we published last year. If you are interested, you can um, definitely ping me uh, or you can go to uh, check the paper. Um, then after that, actually, I, I, I joined Google. Um, I had a conversation with Matthew, uh, who's also a <coughs> researcher in Google Seattle. We, we thought about what's unique in this long tail recognition problem. Because if you, you see the publications in Nomad Machine Learning, Data Mining, or, or Computer Vision, the imbalanced classification is always there. Even before deep learning, it's, it was a very kind of standard and uh, uh, active area. People tried to propose different algorithms for imbalanced classification. If that's the case, what's, what's new here? Um, 
So we call this problem as an old AI problem because it's been there for many, many years. Well, we feel what's new is really on the tail. We have maybe about 90% of all the classes uh, for which we only have about 10% of the training, training set. Or in another way, maybe rephrase it a little bit. For 90% of all the classes we are interested in, uh, they have only 10% of the training data compared to uh, the head class here. So a lot of class classes here really, really are on the tail. And if we only look at the tail, it's basically a new AI problem. It's, it's a few short learning problem. Few short learning people are trying to study this by using uh, meta learning, by using transfer learning, also by using some techniques from zero short learning. So this itself uh, is kind of like a new AI problem. So long tail recognition is trying to blend these two different problems and we want to, okay, do well on the tail, but meanwhile, we do not want to forget the recognition capabilities on the head, right? This. So we were not the only one uh, realized the um, challenge or the need of studying this problem. If you um, review some existing papers uh, over the last two years, uh, starting from roughly about 2018, uh, 19 until 20, including I'm pretty sure in the future, uh, more and more paper, they tried to focus on this problem in particular. This long tail recognition was a feature or a component uh, in some other papers, but now um, people, including myself, we, we feel it's really important to actually to take it out and the independent um, um, task to study, try to solve this problem and benefit all different uh, downstream tasks. So I want to draw your attention to this one, especially because uh, I see uh, Ji Cheng uh, after me will present uh, this very interesting paper. Okay, so what do they do? Um, almost all of them, including the last one in the second stage, what they do is try to reweigh the training loss or they try to oversample or unsample uh, some of the data uh, in the training stage, which is not surprising. Um, but I want to study this problem from, from a domain adaptation perspective. Why? Because it's, it's really naturally a domain adaptation problem. You see, we have a long tail training set. We want to have a high quality classifier which is embarrassed, which should perform well on all the classes. So in other words, although the training set, we have a long tail distribution over classes, but we want the classifier to perform really, really well on all the classes uniformly. So there is mismatch between the training and the, the testing. So naturally, therefore, we can use some domain adaptation techniques to, to study this problem. Um, here, um, yeah, bear with me. Let me try to explain uh, what these equations are. Th those equations are very um, uh, um, kind of like the, the, the very basic and old question, uh, equations in domain adaptation. So this is a loss function. And F here is the, you can consider neural network we are going to, rec to learn. What we want to have is a small loss function over a uniform distribution on target. So it should perform well on all classes. Therefore, the loss should be small on all classes as well. But we don't have any data, of course, from the testing. Uh, we only have data from a training distribution. The so we call it the source dis distribution. And you can see in order to change these two variables, we have to add a waiting term here. After that, we can decompose the waiting term. We can decompose the waiting term by the marginal distribution over classes, as well as conditional distribution. Here, images conditioning on class Y. Okay, we, we do this for both the target distribution and source distribution. Now, for these two terms, PT over PSY, we denote it by uh, omega Y here. And for the, here, the ratio uh, colored in red, we denote it by one plus epsilon. So, Exiting work, they try to actually do class 
wise balancing. They weigh the data or weigh the uh, loss terms according to different classes. So effectively, what they did was they assume epsilon is zero. They only care about the weighting for each class. They do not care about the weighting for each example. So that's the hidden assumption in the existing work. So it, which is, I, I feel uh, probably this is worth sharing with the community that uh, this perspective really reveals a hidden assumption uh, in the existing work. So that's why we basically uh, read everything out, uh, did a little bit more careful analysis to see when this assumption makes sense and when this assumption actually does not. By assuming this is zero, what we actually trying to um, do is we assume this part pt x given y and ps x given y, they are the same. Meaning that given a class y, the training images should be, basically here I use cat as an example, all the training cats, they should really try to represent the testing uh, distribution of the cat. Uh, maybe that's true for the head classes because we have a lot of training images for the head. But for tail classes, no, I, I think it's definitely no because we only have a few training images for a tail class. It's really hard to use them to have a good representation of the targeted distribution, uh, conditional distribution, so given a class, I, I call it a tag. So in other words, we should not make this assumption for the tail classes, although we could make an assumption for the head. So we feel this is worth sharing with the community. That therefore, we wrote it into a, a paper submitted to 3PR this year. Uh, we got a, a actually pretty good uh, response. So we were selected an oral paper. All I want to uh, tell, maybe even after this talk, you could not remember a lot of things. Please try to remember that long tail recognition, in essence, is a domain adaptation problem because they have different distributions between training and testing. So after we reviewed this assumption, therefore we try to learn not only the class-wise weight, we also try to learn a weighting function or weighting term for each of the training examples. I will emote the details. If you're interested, are welcome to talk to me maybe offline. And we did experiments on six, um, including the two very natural organic um, long-tailed uh, data sets. We got a sniff other results. Um, okay, so I will try to summarize here about the long-tailed distribution. And so we can focus on, on this page, yes. So I want to see here long-tailed distribution. A long-tailed recognition is a domain adaptation perspective uh, because this pers perspective enables us to, to understand this problem, also actually to enable us to design new methods, new techniques to solve this problem. Because you can see here, domain adaptation itself is really right now, I feel, a powerhouse of all different uh, techniques, like learning domain environment uh, representations, curriculum uh, learning, adversarial training, uh, client fair discrepancy, data augmentation and synthesize, a lot of techniques and hope, I, I, I hope they can benefit uh, the uh, challenge in long tail recognition. Okay. Um, okay, so far uh, we have been talking about this. All oh, right, sorry. Yeah, there is a catch I want to um, emphasize before I move on. Traditional domain adaptation, they usually review some of the data from the targeted domain uh, in the training stage. Therefore, when we train the model, we see some unlabeled data from the target. We can anticipate what scenario there will be in the testing stage. But in long tail recognition, uh, please don't do that because we already know in the testing stage, the data will be balanced, will be roughly balanced. We want to do well on all classes. So we don't need any additional data from the target. So we just learn from the source although we consider it as a, a domain adaptation perspective. Okay, um, I, will, I will try to uh, ramp up my talk in about three or five minutes. So organizers, please don't worry. Um, so, but let me move on. So, so far, 
talking about the long-tailed recognition is mainly about the training data. So we want to do well in the wild. We want to scale, push the boundary of visual recognition to more and more classes. And the more classes we have, uh, the long, longer-tailed um, uh, distribution we will have uh, in the training stage. But what, we, what, what happens after we deploy the model to the real world? Here, I want to show you if we want to, for example, let, like a self-driving a, a self car to drive from New York to Seattle, what's going to happen? And you can imagine, no matter how well you train your model, there will be some scenario that maybe you could not cover. Maybe when we train, for example, here, a uh, semantic segmentation model, we try to get data from all different weather conditions. Mm, I'm not sure maybe you can cover all of the weather conditions, like in the overcast weather condition, maybe you would miss, or it would be underrepresented in your training data, but it definitely will show up in the testing stage. So in other words, in, in, in the testing stage, we actually have a compound domain I mean, this is one domain, one weather condition, this another weather condition, another weather condition. They all compound together to challenge our model. We also have some open domain, which is probably not seen during the training. They will show up, they will challenge our model. So in, recognize, uh, in recognition of this model, this problem, we try to formalize it into also a research problem. Uh, here is the definition. Uh, I hope you um, agree, but feel free to argue with me if you feel actually this is not a very good um, f formulation of this real world problem. We always try to get a real world problem and then try to um, formalize it into a, a lab kind of study uh, scenario such that we can study using uh, our research efforts. Here, we formalize it in the following way. We have a lot of training data from the source domain. And we have a lot of unlabeled data here from different domains, different weather conditions. You can assume some of them are labeled, but for the, the sake of interest, we don't assume they are labeled. We got some data from those domains, but we don't have any uh, labeled data. Okay, then we try to train the model. Try to make it as robust as possible. Therefore, on the testing stage, we have testing data from them. The model is gonna perform well. But meanwhile, we also get testing data from a new domain. Um, we hope the model can generalize to this new domain as well. That's why we call it open here. This is open and compound. Here is compound domain adaptation. Um, this is also a paper published this year. So I will probably skip all the details. Uh, give you some high level idea that in the paper, we designed three different um, uh, data sets to formalize this problem. One on semantic segmentation. Uh, here you see the face identity. Also a very small uh, data set um, to, for you to quickly tune the model, quickly try out some ideas on digit recognition. We also provided a preliminary approach in the paper. Uh, which is, so in the training state, we have labeled data from the source, and we have a lot of unlabeled data from uh, a lot of different targeted domains. We don't know which, from which domain they are from. Therefore, we call them kind of like latent domain. Uh, idea we did in the paper is kind of like curriculum learning. We try to um, simplify this problem in a bi-domain adaptation problem, although we have a compound target which has a lot of domains, but we try to simplify it into a bi-domain adaptation problem and some of them one by one, gradually, we, we, we aim to achieve some domain invariant features for all these uh, different domains. Okay, so let me, let me, let me summarize um, um, this talk. Um, I feel we have, as a community, uh, we have made a really great progress in computer vision and we have seen already a lot of exciting applications in the real world. So I would really hope that when in the future we try to do research, we have a open, open mandate methodology, which is we try to foresee what's happening in the real world, and then we formalize them into research problems. And then we do the research uh, 
in the forward path, in the forward way, forward thinking scenario. Um, here I give you two examples uh, following that philosophy or uh, kind of research methodology. One, in the real world, um, a lot of classes, therefore the training set will be long-tailed. Uh, no matter which problem we want to study, object recognition, segmentation, detection, therefore we can formalize, uh, they, they all have this long-tailed scenario. So we formalize this into an independent problem. We try to pro pro provide some new perspective from domain adaptation. The hope is the techniques in domain adaptation uh, could benefit this long-tailed recognition. Also, we are running some experiments from uh, meta-learning for long-tailed recognition because, as I said earlier, it's a balance between old AI, which is class imbalanced recognition, and new AI, which is the field shot learning. And field shot learning, and you can see Meta learning is one of the most successful techniques. So maybe it will help us to do long tail recognition as well. So that's one. The second one, when we try to go to the wild, is we need to handle all different testing scenarios. We have a compound target domain, which has data from all different domains. Uh, in order to handle them, I think this workshop, learning from imperfect data, I think will benefit this problem. The reason is the more data we have, no matter they are unlabeled, they are noisy, they are imperfect, they will improve our model's robustness because they will reveal at least the scenarios and the testing stage. With that, I will um, stop here and uh, happy to take questions offline. Thank you. Uh, Levi, do you want to take over? Oh, thank you. Thanks, Bo Qing, for the great talk and also uh, uh, several very interesting works. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, like, thanks, Bo Qing's talk. Uh, I think the next one, uh, next one is uh, 